Amen. Come on, you can do better than that. Give the Lord a hand clap off this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. God is good. If you'll remain standing just for a moment as I read the Word. I only have one. I'm beginning, I'm beginning just one passage this morning before I get into the other passages, so you won't have to stand too long. This morning I want to begin reading in the book of Galatians. Chapter 6, verse 9. And the Bible reads this way, it says, And let us not grow weary. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Father, I thank You for the reading of Your Word this morning. And I ask, Father, as we go into this Word, that, Father, You open every spiritual eye, that You open every spiritual mind, You open the, every heart. That, Father, they hear this Word. And this Word, Father, will be a seed this morning. And that it will find good ground in their lives. And that it will grow and begin to produce, Father, fruit in their lives. But not only fruit, but good fruit. And not only good fruit, but good fruit, Father, that will remain in their lives. And I speak to any distraction, any thought that the enemy wants to bring in right now to distract from this Word and the thoughts that You've given me to prepare this morning, that they be pushed away, Father. And that Your light and Your life will come in and water this Word. And we speak it forth, Father, now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we agree upon it this morning as a fellowship of believers. And everybody says... Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning I want to bring a message entitled Living in Neutral. And this passage we just read, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. This Word is speaking to us today, and the first thing it is speaking to us today is that there is a season. There is a season in which we shall reap. Amen. And in this Word here, it's not just a season. It says it is a, it is a due season. So. It, if it is a due season, exactly what is a due season? What does a due season mean in the, in, the, in the context of this passage right here? In this passage right here, when God speaks of a due season, He is speaking of God working and moving in His own time. How many know that there is our time and there is God's time? And how many know that we so many times want God to move in our time as opposed for us waiting and moving in God's time? So due season right here is talking about, uh, talking about the moving of God in a season in God's own time from a seed that has already been planted but yet has not reached maturity in the season and has yet to spring up. This, this, this time between the seed of being planted and due season is the time that uh, our bread, per se, is cast upon the waters. It is the, it is the space that is in between. How many know that there is a space that is in between the time of planting and the time of reaping? What are you saying, Pastor Allen? I'm getting ready for my garden, and as I did, I've got I've got about three. Oh, one, two, one, two, three, not three. Two, seven, two, three. I went to White House. You gotta give me a second here. Amen. Hey. <laughs> about 250. I got about 250 pods that I went in and I put the soil in those little pods, and and I I went and put the seed in those pods, and I labeled the seeds. How many understand how much it is? 
to label. There's a whole sermon right there about labeling your seed that we won't get into this morning. Because it, but uh, you need to label your seed, amen, so you know what's coming up. And, and uh, so I, I, I labeled the seed and I, and I put the seed down and all the stuff and, and then I went and I, I poured water on it and I watered it and I did everything I was supposed to do. So I made my planting and now I was sitting in the in between. I am still in the in between. Brandon went out to the garden uh, yesterday. Thank God, last year he bought one of those. He has a tractor out there on the on the farm, and and he bought one of those big wide plows. Somebody say amen. See, so you didn't say amen very loud because you ain't never used a, you've never used a tiller yourself. Amen. And uh, I have a good tiller, but when you got sixty by a hundred feet, I don't care how big your hand tiller is. It's going to beat you half silly. Somebody say amen to that one. So he went out last year. He went out last year and he got one of those nice things. And I went out there and to, to, to work and to, to suffer and to, and, and to get ready to put that garden in. And he just hooked that tractor up and he went over there and he just started just driving across it. And guess what that tiller did? It just sat there. I just sat there. No. <laughs> it, it started tear, It just started tearing that up, and he went over it three or four times. And the time he got finished, you could walk in it and just sink that deep uh, up in the dirt. But and and that was great. But that was a preparation time from the time that I planted. And how many know that I have not yet reaped anything? Because even though I'm in my in between. I still have to prepare for the reaping. In due season. In due season. In God's time, there's a due season. There is an in-between. And in the in-between from the time I plant and from the time I reap, there is an in-between which I need to be going out and doing good. This says, go out and do good. Do not be weary in doing good because in due season you shall reap. Now, I planted all those seeds in that garden or in my, in my planters and everything, and I sat, and two weeks later, guess what? Nothing sprouted. Nothing sprouted. I said, what in the world am I doing wrong? So I got on the Internet. Thank God for the Internet. How many know everything on the Internet is true, right? And, uh, and uh, <laughs> well, I'm not going there. And, and I got on the internet and I started reading some, reading some stuff from some of the plant people and I realized, oh, I know what's wrong because I'm doing it. I'm doing it in a little thing in the, outside the, in the garage and outside the garage. And, and I said, you know what I need to do? I just had a fluorescent light over it. And I said, that's not the right type of light. I need certain types of light hitting it right here. So I went and got a plant light that has certain, certain LEDs on it that, that need to, to, to help, the, help the seed. And then I got some heating pads and put them up underneath the seed so the so the ground would stay at a certain temperature so that the seed could sprout. Did you know that once I did that within two days every pod in that thing burst out because in my time of sowing and my waiting for the reaping I was in my in between and there were some things that I needed to do in the in between so that the seed would plant and I had to be doing something. Many times we plant and we just wait for it to, we just wait for the crop to come in and the crop doesn't come in because we put the seed in the seed is still dead in the ground because we did nothing in the in between. How many are with me? Amen. That was free. That's not even in my notes. Amen. There's a space in between in which we live before that due season. But the deeper meaning, the deeper meaning of, of in due season goes way beyond just us planting a seed and reaping a harvest. When we hear this message and we hear something like this, we usually are hearing about planting a seed and reaping your harvest a little later. And that's good. When we plant, we reap. That's good. When we plant and we, and we do the things that I was just talking about right here, when we go back in, we reap. And those things are, are good, but those are temporal blessings. 
Those are temporal blessings. When I plant a seed and I'm faithful in my getting, and God supplies for me in my time of need, just like He's doing with Joe and them. That's wonderful that God is taking care of them and supplying for them. And He's taking care of them. There is, that is still a temporal thing. How many know how temporal your dollar bill is? How many's noticed how temporal it is? Amen? I went and bought, I got Teresa a little raised bed that I'm going to put, I'm going to put uh, the miracle, the miracle grow stuff that I use in there. Last year, I paid six dollars a bag, one and a half cubic foot, for that miracle grow. I went and got the same bag this year and paid twelve dollars for the same dirt <laughs> that I bought last year. And the kids come over in the house and they'll be there today with us for a little while and they'll come over to the house and Teresa went out. I don't know why she did it. I know the Holy Ghost wasn't talking to her. But she did it anyway. And she went out and she bought those kids a bunch of fool little tools and garden tools and, and buckets and, and rakes and, and shovels and, and all this stuff. And the first thing they want to do when they go outside is they want to pick up the shovels and the rakes and go right down where I got my $12 dirt. And they want to take all that $12 dirt and just throw it in the air. And they think it's so funny. And I'm sitting there going, oh God, i got to pay for that. <laughs> Come on, somebody say amen. But those are temporal things. And we spend, we spend so much time on seed and reaping of temporal things. There's a deeper meaning here than a, this is not, this right here where it says, do not grow weary in doing good and due season shall reap if you do not lose heart. This is not talking about temporal blessings. There's a deep, deeper meaning. The deeper meaning here is that do not lose heart because you will reap. What is the reaping? The reaping is, uh, the, reaping is the kingdom of heaven. The reaping is, is God. The reaping is our salvation. If we not do weary and doing good in due season, we shall reap. It's not just a temporal thing, but we shall reap the kingdom of heaven. We shall reap it in eternity with, with and in the presence of our heavenly Father. It's more than just it's more than just planting my seed and cashing in at the end of the harvest season. It is more than just sowing and to reap something in a temporal blessing. It is talking to the internality of our Heavenly Father. He's saying, do not lose heart because if you will not lose heart and you'll stand your ground and you'll get up in the morning and you'll keep on going, I will be there. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be there and there will be a season that that you will reap and that reaping will not be a dollar bill. It will not even be your health. It won't be this over. It will be the kingdom of God in my presence. In due season you shall reap. Can I tell you this morning That heaven is at war. Heaven is at war with the powers of darkness. And you may think that all the stuff that's going on around us, why are you talking about this, Pastor? I'm talking about because we get so stuck on the temporal. And you might think that all the junk's going on around us right now in this world are just earthly things going on. Can I tell you that the Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel, and I can't read it all, and I won't read any of it because I can't read the whole thing, but in Ezekiel chapters 37 through 39, take it home tonight and read it this tonight, read it this afternoon, read it during this week and see what I'm saying is not true. The, Ezekiel begins to speak to a lot of things that are going to take place, and he begins to speak, says that Rosh, he says that Rosh, Rosh is the ancient name for the peoples who live in the territory right now where Russia is. That's where we get our name Russia, is from Rosh. It began to transform over the, over the centuries and finally began to be called uh, Russia. And, and Ezekiel is speaking to the people of Rosh. He says, that, he, and he says that Rosh will begin to rise up. That great bear in the Bible, that Russia will rise up and come together with the kings of the east. Who are the kings of the east? 
is China. And he will come with the kings of Persia, who are, the, who are nowadays the kings of the Persians. It's Iran and Syria. And if you'll take a look right now, you can see that Bible prophecy is coming alive all around us as, as, as the bears begin to rise up and to flex his muscles to see what he can do. He's making, he's making, he's making, uh, he's making commitments with, with the kings of the east. He's, uh, uh, the Russians already have troops down in Syria, troops down in Iran getting ready to, 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 to do whatever they're going to do. They're already forming these packs. And you're saying, what's going on that Pastor Allen? I'll tell you what's going on right now. It's more than just a bad dictator trying to conquer a little bit of territory. There's a spiritual side right here that we need to stop right now and take a look at. War, heaven is at war with the powers of darkness and the Antichrist spirit is rising up in and the leaders around our world all over the place. And you know I'm telling you the truth. You can feel it in the pit of your stomach that something is wrong, that something is off balance around us. And I'll tell you what is wrong. And I'll tell you what is off balance. That men and women that are in power, that are in leadership around the world and even in our nation have yielded themselves and bowed to, and, and bowed to the God of this world and to an antichrist spirit. And they are yielding themselves and the Antichrist is beginning to work himself through the, through the political realms around the world right now. That is what we're seeing. Heaven is at war with darkness. I don't like to hear that, Pastor. I want to, you, got, you got to talk about something else. You're scaring me. Don't scare me, preacher. Tell me something nice. Come on. Why in the world would that scare you? Listen to me. There is no need for us to fear the Antichrist spirit. People don't talk about it because people it, it makes them uneasy. They get scared. There's no, there's no need to fear the Antichrist spirit. There's no fear. To, there's no need to fear the mark of the beast. We spend so much time looking for the mark of the beast that we miss the Savior. Come on, some, somebody listen to me. Say, what do you mean, Pastor? I want you to listen to me. The Bible and the book of Revelation and the Word of God and the testimony of the Word of God in the Bible that He has given us, especially through the book of Revelation, is it not a story about heaven, how heaven loses the battle and how heaven loses control and falls in defeat to the enemy? The Bible and the book of Revelation and all the other prophecy is a, is a book about victory. It's a book about overcoming. It's a book about the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a story of the church triumphant, my friend. I'm not worried about an antichrist. I'm not worried about. I'm not worried about a mark of the beast. I'm worried about keeping my eyes on Jesus because if this book is true and I believe this true, that the battle has already been won. It's just being played out the way it needs to be playing out. And I am a child of God, and He's coming after me, and I'm going home. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 says, And now I saw, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on the horse was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses, and now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike down the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the rhyme press, and the fierce of the wrath of the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh a name has been written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can I tell you this morning, this is not a story about defeat, this is not a story about the Antichrist, this is not a story about a beast. This is a story about a church triumphant. Amen. This is a story of a God removing the seed of sin. 
by His coming again. And we may forever be in the presence and with of the presence of our Heavenly Father and with those who have gone before us. This is a story of His return to call His people out. This is a story of Him coming back and bringing a new heaven and a new earth built and occupied the way God intended. But Pastor, what about all the things going on around us today? What about this? What about that? Listen to me right now. You can listen to all of it, and I know we've got to pay attention to what's going around us, and I, and I, and I try my best to stay attention, and I, and I listen to what I need to listen to. But I'm going to tell you this. There will come a day that that Russian bear of the north and that dragon of the east and that Persian king will stand up and rise up their head, but the, but the line of Judah will rise up on top of that and lay out a great war. And when that comes on, my friend, can I tell you that that the Bible tells me, and I believe what this word says, that when that day comes and that lion of Judah begins to roar, that the lion of Judah will prevail. Amen. God is on the move. People are staking, people are taking stands. Today that never decided to stand up for anything or stand began to stand up for what they think is right. We have mothers that are standing up against school boards demanding the right, demanding the right given to them by God and by our Constitution to say, you will not teach my children this nonsense and all of this mess and I'm going to stand up. I'm tired of being quiet. I'm tired of sitting back. I stand up and I'm not going to stand up and stand for it anymore. They're saying we're all God's children, whether we're white, whether we're Asian, whether we're black, whether we're brown, or whether we're tan. We're all the children of God. And you will not decide who my child is or what my child is. You'll not decide if they're unisex or dual sex or trial sex or undersex or oversex. It ain't none of your business. That is my child given to me by God Almighty. And I have the right by God to raise them the way I see fit. What are we seeing, preacher? We're seeing the physical manifestation of the war between heaven and darkness. We, the church, are the hands and feet of God in this earth. And we need to step up and quit stepping back. Pastor, I thought your, your sermon was about living in neutral. Well, that was my prelog. That's just the, pre, that's the preface. I'm getting to the message now. We need to begin to stay and pray instead of running and hiding. We need to get into gear instead of trying to find ways to live our lives in neutral. Why, Pastor? Because heaven has declared war. Heaven has declared war on suicide. In the last ten years, there is an epidemic of suicide in our teenagers and our young adults. We have lost more teenagers to suicide in the last 10 years than any time in recorded history. In the last two years, our young adults and our teenagers have lost hope because the world is offering nothing, no solutions to anything. All they're doing is grabbing power and trying to do whatever they can to control everything. And our, our young people and our young adults have lost hope. 
and we're seeing them by the droves. They're turning themselves over to fentanyl. They're turning themselves over other kind of drugs, over to heroin. There, heroin. there are many drugs that we have not seen even hardly introduced or, or, or thought that had kind of moved to the, uh, the wayside that are now resurfacing back within our communities now because everybody's looking for something because there's no hope around them. They're, they they got their eyes on the world and the eyes on what's going on around them. They're going to the bars and when the bar's over, they figure out the bar has no peace. They're going to the, they're having sexual relationships with whoever they may ever and they go out and they find out that when that's all over, everything is still empty and they're still as empty as they were before if not even more. They're going to, they're going to try it out to find am I a girl or am I a guy or am I both or what am I? There's people going out there trying to get their, their gender changed to be, a, to be a dog, to be a cat, to be a rabbit, to be, a, to be an elk, to be a deer. All kinds of crazy things going on because they're lost and there's no hope going on and they don't, they don't realize what's happening and because of that, the suicide rate is just blowing out the roof because they've lost sight of who they are. Heaven has declared war on suicide. And we are the hands and we are the feet of Christ. If no one else will go, if no one else will plead, if no one else will reach out and help, then who will do it? We are the hands and feet of our Heavenly Father. Heaven has declared war on depression, fear, and worry. Heaven has declared war on anxiety and has declared war on sin. Heaven has declared war on demonic oppressions and spiritual darkness. And we, the church, and the children of God need to invest into this war with our lives. If you're going to say amen with me today, you should have said it already because I'm fixing to get down. We have to quit living our lives in neutral. What do you mean, Pastor Allen? Matthew chapter 12, verse 20. Or verse 30. The Bible says, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. I don't think you can get much clearer than that. What is this saying, Pastor Allen? It's saying there is no neutral position. You are either for me or against me. Pastor, I thought I could just do whatever I want to and all I got to do is listen to me. You're either for Him or you are against Him. You are either gathering into the kingdom or you are scattering the kingdom. Oh, I'm not scattering the kingdom. Your neutrality scatters the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Teresa was making something yesterday. I don't know what she was making. It wasn't for me. It was for her. One of her plant-based wonderful, delectable things that she makes. <laughs> And she was making it. She, she jumped up out of the living room, ran to the kitchen. Said, How can people even eat this? And that's, that's what I've been thinking. No. I love you, but I was just kidding. But she did. She goes, How can people eat this? And I said, What do you mean? She said, So I forgot, I forgot, to, put, I forgot to put sugar in it. And evidently, if you don't have sugar in whatever that was, it's pretty nasty. But when you're neutral and you don't have the things in your life that need to be in your life, it causes the things around your life to scatter from the kingdom. You're either with me or against me. 
You are either gathering into the kingdom. How many understand what I'm saying? Or we are scattering the kingdom. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Listen to this. I know your works. That you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. How much plainer can this stuff get? What are you saying, Pastor? I want you to listen. There isn't a neutral ground that you can live in. You're going to be for Him or you're going to have to be against Him. You are either living for God or you're living without God. It's that cut and dry. And what about this and this? That's what sin, what our weaknesses in our life, that's why we have grace. How many are grateful for grace? I'm not talking about your weaknesses. I'm, not talk, I'm talking about your heart. You're either for Him or you're what? You're either living with Him or you're living without Him. Now, back to my Scripture. I finally got there. Galatians 6, 9. I'm going to read this from, I'm going to read this from a different translation simply because it makes a point that I want to make. And let us not lose heart and grow weary and and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time, as due season, and at the, at, at the appointed season, we shall reap. Here's the last part. Listen to this. We shall reap. If we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. He said, the only way that you're going to walk into your due season is you can't loosen your spirit. You can't allow distraction to take your eyes off of God. You cannot relax your courage. You see, when you loosen your spirit and you begin to relax your courage in the in-between time of your sowing of your life and the reaping of your Heavenly Father, when you begin to loosen your spirit and you begin to relax in your courage, you take the, your life like a car and you shift it out of gear and you shift into neutral. When you are shifted into neutral, you can be pushed or directed in any direction. When you are in neutral, the slightest incline becomes impossible. And the slightest decline, and it's going to get away from you. Come on, amen? When you are in neutral, you see, many of us are in neutral today. Many houses of worship are in neutral. They got great singing, they got great preaching, they got all the lights, they got the smoke, they got everything they need, but the church is in neutral. There's ministries that are just in neutral. There are lives that are watching me online today that are just in neutral. There are people sitting with me today in this house that because of COVID and because of, of abuses and because of rejections and because of things that have taken place in your life, you've shifted your life out of gear into, into neutral. Because of social issues, because of the politics, because of health issues, because of family issues, financial issues, have caused you to shift your life into neutral. When you are in neutral, you can be pushed or led anywhere. And it's usually to disaster. My daughter, can I, I know it's five to twelve. Can, can I have ten minutes? I only got two pages left. 
after my story. My daughter, Danae, I can talk about her, she's not here. So she can't defend herself. But she is the junk car queen. Every car she's has has been a something somebody's given her. Thank God for it. They finally bought a car. Amen. They got a nice car now. But all up to that point right there, it's always been a junk car. And if it wasn't for Charles Shue back there, uh, she would never she wouldn't be able to get nowhere. He spent more he's probably spent more time on her cars than all the other cars he's ever worked on put together. <laughs> and I remember we had this Acura which Blackie bought and regretted. <laughs> I think it was the Acura. Uh, there's been so many, I can't thought, but my mind's telling me it's the Acura. And it broke down in Hendersonville over by a Waffle House, which is a good place to break down. <laughs> ain't, ain't that right, Leon? <laughs> And it broke down at a Waffle House and, and they couldn't get it started or nothing. So I called Charles and Charles ran out there to meet me. And we, and we pulled the car dolly over there and we're going to put, we're gonna, uh, put the car and he couldn't get it started. So he's going to put the car in neutral and push it up on the, the car dolly. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, that Acura buddy has an MX. And I'm going to tell you something, it was heavy. So, we decided, well, there's no way we're going to be able to get over that hump on the car dolly just by pushing it. Because all we had was me and Charles at that point. Thank God we had a couple guys come and give us a hand. Too much of a hand, but they gave us a hand. So we decided we're going to put that dolly down here toward the road because there was a little bit of a Decline to help get a little momentum. Makes sense, doesn't it? But here's the problem. We got our momentum. But we got too much momentum. And because it was in neutral, couldn't stop. So we didn't just get the car Tires on the dolly. We got the whole car on the dolly. And then we had a whole new set of problems. Because now the car is sitting on the dolly on the on on the uh, on the oil pan. And how long I don't remember, Charles, you remember how long we was working on that? Maybe you had three and a half, four hours. We had, we had to call a friend in. We jacked that thing up. We put blocks and we put wood and we put trying to get that thing up and we'd get it and we'd try to steer that thing around and, and, and you had to leave it in what? As soon as we get it situated where it needs to be and we get it down and slide it up, try to get it, it would just go wherever it wanted to go. Time we were... Time we were time we were finished. We were on the side of the road at the at the turn off to go to to, to go on uh, to, to veterans right there, and we're sitting there, and we still had that car halfway on. Took it, we finally got it on it, but the problem was when the car was in in neutral, you don't have any control. When we put our lives in neutral. When we put our spirituality in neutral. When we take our relationship with Christ and we gear it down in neutral. Because somebody said something. Somebody did something. Somebody made me mad. Somebody knocked the chip off my shoulder. I'm just going to be honest with you. How many know what I'm talking about? And I'm going to just put myself in neutral. When you put yourself into neutral, that's when your life begins to go crazy because you don't have any control. The slightest 
The slightest incline, you cannot go up. And the slightest decline, you can't control going down. And if you're not careful and, and, the, de- and the, the decline is behind you, your, your, car, you're gonna, your life is going to start going backwards and it's going to go backwards and you're going to be able to do anything about it until you hit whatever you're going to hit. How many understand what I'm saying? So this word this morning is calling us to stand. And not to loosen or relax our faith or our courage. It's calling us. It's calling us to shift out of the neutrality of our life and put our life and put our ministry and put our service in the ministry back into gear. Don't worry, I'm almost finished. Some of you are going to sleep, but that's all right. We got coffee out there. Just, just take another switch. It reminds me of the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 8. Actually, the chapter 14, but especially verse 8. And the Bible is speaking of the woman in the alabaster box. How many remember that story? The alabaster box of precious oil. She breaks it and anoints the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says in Mark 14, 8, it reads this way. She's got it up. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. She broke it and anointed the feet of Jesus. And the Word of God says that she had done all she could. In Christ's terms, as the people begin to complain and says she will be remembered forever because she stopped and she did what she could. Now listen, if you missed everything else, I want you to get this. If you will do what you can do, and God will do what you can't do. And God won't do what you can't do until you do what you can. What are you saying, preacher? You can't do what you can do if you're in neutral. I believe many are just sitting back in neutral waiting for God to do what they can't do. But God can't do what you can't do until you shift out of neutral and begin to do what you can do. You see, some of us need to get back in church. You do realize that we wouldn't have seating room in here if everybody that says they go to this church showed up this morning. If everybody I minister to during the week showed up today, we wouldn't have enough room to sit them. Some of us need to kick our lives out of neutral and kick our lives back into gear. How many follow me? Some of us need to become involved in the church again. Some of us need to begin to teach again. And kick our lives out of neutral. We need to, we, some of us need to begin to serve again. Do you understand what the church did to me? The church, the church might have done to you that, but God didn't do that to you. And God has a call on your life. And God has His hand on your life. And it's time for you to get out of whatever caused you to click your life into neutral and kick your life back in gear and begin to do what God has called and prepared your life and given you the talents to do. It's time to get out of neutral and put your life into gear. Somehow people have come to believe the lie from the devil that kicking back in neutral is a godly thing. But I read you the passages earlier. There is no neutrality in God. You are either in or out. You're you're hot or cold. You're either gathering or scattering. You see, 
neutrality when you're living your life in neutral. Neutral only attends the fellowship of believers when it's convenient. When you're living your life in neutral, a neutral life only gives and is faithful in their giving when it wants to. When you're living your life in neutral, you only participate and serve if you get your way. You see, neutral is suspicious. And neutral isolates. This morning, we need to get our lives back into gear. We need to get our ministries back into gear. We need to get our church and the church of our Lord Jesus Christ all over. We need to kick, our churches need to kick back into gear. Because we are in unprecedented time, and now is the, not the time to shift into neutral. Now is the time to shift into gear. So listen to me, church. Do not loosen your faith. Do not relax your courage. Do not shift into neutral. Let's kick it up. Let's kick it back into gear. Because I'm telling you, look at the signs around us. The kingdom of God is at hand. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed.